Okay, welcome back everybody. Great. All right, we'll revive our motivation. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. Letting that sink in. So we were looking at relative bodhicitta or conventional bodhicitta, and we were looking at ultimate or absolute bodhicitta, that, those two. And we're starting to shift more into the ultimate bodhicitta realm. And we did just kind of a quick overview of basis, path, and result. Um, by verse, okay, so verse 119 kind of gives us a snapshot of what I was talking about last session. It says, by practicing this, by practicing this way, the two bodhicittas of the ultimate and the conventional truth, and thus by completing without interference collections of insight and merit as well, may all of us quickly attain full enlightenment, granting what we and all others have wished. So in Mahayana Buddhism, the union of method and wisdom is central to understanding and practicing the path to complete enlightenment. So one without the other is not gonna carry you all the way to the end of the path. So <clears throat> when we're looking at method, it was verses like this, where they say, in short then, whatever unfortunate sufferings we haven't desired, crash upon us like thunder. This is the same as the smith who has his life, who has taken his life with a sword he had fashioned himself. Our sufferings, the wheel of sharp weapons returning, full circle upon us from wrongs we have done. Hereafter, let's always have care and awareness never to act in non-virtuous ways. All of the sufferings that we have endured in the lives we have led in the three lower states, as well as our pains of the present and future are the same as the case of the forger of arrows who later was killed by an arrow he's made. Our sufferings, the wheel of sharp weapons returning, full circle upon us from wrongs we have done. Hereafter, let's always have care and awareness, never to act in non-virtuous ways. So here's how we're thinking from the method perspective. And then we switch to the wisdom perspective and eventually unite them. So the wisdom verses are things like this in 106. There is nothing substantial to anyone's life force. It crumbles apart like a water soaked log. And there is nothing substantial to anyone's lifespan. It bursts in an instant like bubbles of foam. All things of this world are but a fog-like appearance. When closely examined, they fade out of sight. Like mirages, these things at a distance seem lovely, but when we come closer, they are not to be found. So there's kind of references at the beginning to just impermanence, which is not the same thing as emptiness, but impermanence is point pointing us to an understanding of emptiness. And then we get into that appearances not being in accordance with reality kind of imagery, like mirages. And then it continues, all things are like images found in a mirror, and yet we imagine they are real, very real. All things are like mist or like clouds on a mountain, and yet we imagine they are stable and firm. Our foe, our insistence on ego identities, truly our own, which we wish were secure, and our butcher, the selfish concern for ourselves, like all things, these appear to be truly existent, though they never have been truly existent at all. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so then 108 says, although they appear to be concrete and real, they have never been real anytime, anywhere. They're not things we should burden with ultimate value, nor should we deny them their, their relative truth. As our grasping for egos and love for ourselves lack substantial foundations with true independence, how can they yield acts that exist by themselves? 
And then how can this cruel, vicious circle of suffering, the fruit of these actions, be real from its core? Although all things thus lack inherent existence, yet just as the face of the moon can be seen in a cup of clear water reflecting its image, the various aspects of cause and effect appear in this relative world as reflections. So please, in this world of appearances only, let's always be sure what we do is a virtue and shun all those acts that would cause us great pain. <clears throat> so what we're talking about here is that understanding that relative conventional truth is deceptive is not to say we don't need to function within that space and keep ethics and awareness of karma. Ethics and awareness of karma are essential. And that is why it's so important to understand that emptiness is not nihilism. Because if, it, if you go into the nihilistic extreme, then the danger is, is you completely discard ethics and the value of cause and effect and the understanding of the truth of cause and effect. And you either go into a despondent, despair, apathetic, nothing matters place, or you go into a hedonistic, I can do what I want, nothing really matters, nothing really is from its own side, I can do whatever I like, and it doesn't hurt anyone from their own side, it doesn't matter. Hedonistic space, yeah? So if you go into the nihilistic extreme, the cost is really your whole path altogether, because ethics are destroyed. So understanding the emptiness of inherent existence is like tiptoeing to the edge of the cliff of nihilism and tipping one little foot over and then pulling it back. But you're teetering on the edge because it's almost like things don't exist at all, but they do. And we're not negating relative truth. We're just understanding that there's a deceptive quality there. Do you understand? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so very important that ethics and the law of cause and effect still apply despite them being empty of inherent existence. So how do you achieve this perfection of wisdom? There's all these different methods and um, we'll try a couple maybe. So there's, th there's a few. One is to recognize the object to be negated. One is to recognize dependent arising. And then to understand the fallacy of belief in inherent existence and the logic of the emptiness of it. So the first two are to move you to the last one, the deepest one. And, you know, these can be their, each their own meditation or they can be a sequence within one meditation. So what does it mean to recognize the object of negation, this first step, whether it's its own meditation or just one step in a series leading you to the emptiness? What is the object of negation? Do you, do you know? Do you have an educated guess? Okay, so the object of negation, what we're talking about is what is negated by emptiness? What is negated by emptiness? Inherent existence is negated by emptiness. But emptiness is always spoken of in reference to an object, a relative truth. So you have the emptiness of the cup or the emptiness of the person or the emptiness of the idea, but it's always in reference to, right? Another way in which it's not nihilism. So when we're saying the object of negation, specifically in this context, we're talking about the lack of inherently existent self. Which self? This self, right? So you have to understand what the object of negation is before you can negate it. Yeah, you have to feel what it's like. What is the appearance of an inherently existent self like? And that really boils down to how do you identify? What do you centralize on? What feels like the core permanent aspect of you? Make it show itself and then prove it's not there. There is a self, but it's not that one. Okay, that one is the one that doesn't exist at all, even conventionally. The conventionally existent self is that which is merely labeled on the collection of parts. Okay, no problem, it's not causing any trouble. The object of negation, however, is a complete fabrication. It's an illusion, complete illusion. So what we have to do is provoke it into prominence. You have to get it to show itself to you. Because when you're happy and relaxed or just kind of in a neutral state, it doesn't seem like you have a particular issue with grasping at the self. You think, sure, I'm interdependent, merely labeled by the mind. Yep, causes and conditions. Sure, yep, no worries. I am what I am, but not inherently. Yep, that's fine. Until someone says, you did this or this or this. 
Yeah, you are the thief. Yes, <laughs> you are the imposter. Or you are amazing. Oh, you're amazing. You're so beautiful. You're so smart. You're so handsome. So it could be praise or it could be criticism, but suddenly you feel I. Do you know what I mean? Like it solidifies or it kind of comes into prominence. It also happens when you're in danger. So if your life is in threat or your life is praised or your life is criticized, you start to feel that object of negation. And before you jump the gun and say, well, you don't exist at all, prove it. Yeah, you have to prove it. So you have to say, all right, well, if you did inherently exist, let's just say that you do. Let's just say that you do, even though I know you don't, but let's just say that you do. How would you be? Where would you be? Why would you be? <laughs> yeah. What made you? And you just kind of sit there with that feeling of the last time you really felt provoked into selfness in that very obvious grasping way. And you hold that awareness and you ask gentle questions of it that don't make it run away and fade to the background and trick you into believing you've sorted it out. You have to do it very skillfully like a spy, like a clever interrogator and say, okay, so who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Who am I? And you say it to yourself a few times, who am I? Am I the voice in my head or the ability to hear voice? No, those are all dependent arisings. Before I was verbal, I had a self. Before I understood words, I had a self and I grasped it as inherent. So it's not the verbalizations either that I recognize in here or fabricate and have. Those are dependent arising. All right, who am I? Who am I? I am this moment in time, this snapshot in history, this personality trait, this figment of something facade-like. I am what? And you can just, you can either see what arises organically and think, you know, I am Irish, American or whatever, you know, like I am a woman, I am whatever, like let it come up organically or have a list ready to go and say, am I my body? Check within the body for the self, no self there. Collection of parts, merely labeled by the mind. Self existed before the body was formed. All the things, yeah. Okay, then mind. Ah, the mind must be the self, I am tricky. <laughs> yes, and then you look and you see, what is the mind, where is the mind? And you realize the mind also is labeled in dependence upon a collection of parts and mental moments, some of which are moving, some of which are more still, some are more reflective, some are more judgmental, and all of them interacting with one another, influenced by karma and the outside world. There's no core little bit of the mind that is in charge. Yes, they're all kind of collaborating or fighting, <laughs> right? But there's a series of things going on in your mind influencing one another, none of which is a little part of the mind that is the self only. But it can really feel like the mind is the self. So this one is worth more airtime. Yeah. In the beginning, you, you know, the body might feel very much like the self, like, especially if someone tells you that you're ugly or someone tells you that you're beautiful or you tell yourself that because you're reading too many women's magazines, right? The body feels like <laughs> the self, but with a little bit of analysis for grown up people, we kind of shake that off a little bit, at least intellectually, but the mind feels like the self, doesn't it? Yeah. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It does exist. The mind exists. But there's not like a little boss in there that never changes, that then like gathers experiences to it and, you know, changes, but has some sort of hub control thing, you know, some sort of permanent Atman soul thing that never changes that doesn't exist. So the self is labeled on different components of the mind and body. Yeah. So you don't race to that conclusion, even though you're getting there even though you know that's where you're going. You have to be with the object of negation a bit. And once you've been with the object of negation and challenged it a bit, then you might be ready to weave in more things to your meditation, like looking at dependent arising. Yeah, and once you've been looking at dependent arising, that opens up the truth of things being empty. Yeah, so dependent arising even more directly points to emptiness. 
So there's a few ways we can do that. And I'll, I'll walk us through one and then see if you have any questions, but um, I'll keep explaining for a little bit, but jump in if you get confused. So related to that, we, they have verse 117, it says, and now when we try to do close contemplation on voidness or emptiness, how can we even have a feeling of conventional truth at the very same time? Yet what can there be that has true self-existence? And what can there be that lacks relative truth? How can anyone anywhere believe in such things? So we're trying to understand here that in contemplating voidness, then sometimes you go too far and negate the relative. And then when you're looking at the relative, it starts to feel too concrete and you miss out on the fact that it's empty. So the balancing act that we have to do is something a rare practitioner is able to strike. So when you recognize the object to be negated, the object is the self and what is negated is it having a characteristic of being inherently existent, right? So you're looking at the self and negating a certain characteristic. So we recognize it through provoking it into prominence, remembering past moments of a strong belief in it, and then disproving the self-existence in an inherent way through logic. So this distinction between the object and what is negated is important. So you find what you think of as the self. And if you were trying to negate the fact that the body is got a blue hat, you first have to know what a blue hat is and then look on the body to see if there's a blue hat there, right? Then you look and you go, oh, yep, no blue hat there. But you had to know what a blue hat was before you could check and see if the body had one. Right? So similarly, you have to know what an inherently existent self would be like before you can see if yourself is inherent. Does that make sense? Okay, and then this is the classic dependent arising one, which is really excellent. And each one of these can be their own meditation or just your thought that you're having while being triggered, bringing in this awareness. Or you can do all three of them sequentially. So if you're looking at dependent arising as a way to prove that things are empty, you start with causal dependency. And this is looking at how all impermanent phenomena depend on causes and conditions in order to arise. So everything that's impermanent is everything that changes moment to moment to moment. And everything that changes or is produced depends on causes and conditions. But in order to feel that, you have to search for the truth of that. But that comes very close to what we would have learned as kids in science class or biology or chemistry. Yeah, that nothing just pops out of nowhere spontaneously without causes. We know that from science, from the natural world, from our life. Then you shift more subtly to mutual dependency. That all phenomena, permanent and impermanent, depend on parts and whole, as well as context in order to arise. So to say that there's a bicycle, you need to have parts of a bicycle to label bicycle on, right? But the parts of the bicycle don't make it into a bicycle. It's parts, then you label on the parts. So there's, and there's also the context, right? So in order to say this is a small room, you have to contrast it with bigger rooms. In order to say someone is polite, you have to have a conception of what is rude. You know, all of these things are relational. They have mutual dependency. For something to be parts, it has to have a whole. For there to be a whole, there needs to be parts associated with it. They're all mutually dependent. So you know that, but then apply it to the self or the self of someone that you're triggered by and look at how nothing comes out of nowhere, everything is contextual, and the way in which you label things does not mean that's the way that they are. And then the most subtle is dependency through mere designation. So this is all permanent and impermanent phenomena depend on mind's imputation on a valid basis. Okay, so there has to be a mind labeling, and there has to, to be a valid basis upon which to label. Now, a valid basis doesn't mean that it's inherently existent. A valid basis means that it's a basis that within the relative world, people agree on it. 
So something being solid as opposed to liquid, for example. Yeah, as a basis to say, that's water, that's earth. So in the text, in verse 113, it says, when we closely examine effects and their causes, we see that they are both lack inherent existence. They can't stand alone, either whole or apart. Yet they're seen to exist independently, rising and falling events, which in fact are conditioned by various forces, components, and parts. It is this very level on which we experience birth and our death and whatever life brings. So please, in this world, of, let's always be sure what we do is a virtue and shun all those acts that would cause us great pain. When a vase has been filled by the dripping of water, the first drops themselves did not fill it alone, nor was it made full by the last several drops. It was filled by an interdependent collection of causes and forces that came all together, the water, the pourer, the vase and such things. And so to get to this last kind of type of reflection, understanding the fallacy of belief in inherent existence and the logic of the emptiness of it, there's a few different angles to get to the same point. So these aren't totally different points from one another. They're all different angles to get to the same point. So one angle is to think things do not exist inherently or have a natural as in causeless existence because if they did, they would not have to depend on other factors. They could sp spontaneously arise out of nowhere. And you ask, is there anything that has spontaneously arisen out of nowhere with no causes, with no parts? There isn't. Then the other angle is to think things are not established by way of their own characteristics. Because if they did, they wouldn't need to be imputed by language and conception because they would already exist because of their own characteristics. Characteristics would equal creation. Somehow we would just magically know things what they are without as a child, our parents having explained them to us or introduced us to them. They would just magically be obvious as what they are. That's not the case. So then the last angle you can check this at is things do not exist from their own side, from the side of the basis for designating or labeling it. Because if they did, then there would have to be something that is an illustration of it that you can find amongst the basis of imputation in or on the basis. Yeah, something that's telling you from its own side what it is, and it doesn't, you place that label there. Okay, so before we do the meditation, um, do you have some parts of that that you'd want more talking about? <laughs> Bits that you would like to hear more about before we dig in? I feel I need a bit more explanation of the second, um, the second strategy you had there, but that's something I can do by going away myself and contemplating it. That's the, the dependent arising one? Um, yeah, the, the, last, the last slide you had with the three oh. different approaches yes. for doing the second yeah. one I didn't quite follow. <laughs> yeah. and, and the thing is, is that some of them are going to click and some of them aren't. So it's not like you have to understand each strategy. Actually go with the one that makes you go, oh, right. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, definitely sit with it and unpack it if you want to. But some of them actually will hit the note and it's enough to go on. And, and that's why we have logic analysis, debate structure ones. And then we have poetry, imagery, analogy, metaphor ones. And it's kind of like whatever gets you there. Yeah. 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 Um, Venerable Tenzin Pelion, nice to see you. Yes. Thank you. Um, my question, actually, it has to do with uh, if you could comment about uh, the object of negation, hmm. that um, sometimes the um, example is given, uh, which you might have referred to, if we get really afraid or hmm. if we're angry, but for me, somehow, the one that is much more prominent is shame, mm -hmm. you know, it, and so I just wondered if you could comment about that. Yeah, I think you're right, especially for 
us conditioned as we have been, shame definitely feels like the self because this is the self that is not enough, whatever that means. But, you know, it, it crumples or implodes into this has humiliated me. And that one is not there whatsoever. I think that that's actually a really good point. Um, I think that that one can get triggered by praise. You know, if someone says to you, oh, you're so amazing. You're so amazing. Your shame goes, no, I'm not. <laughs> They're going to find out. <laughs> right. Or, you know, I mean, for some people, their pride goes, yes, I am. Thanks for noticing. But most of us kind of crumple, you know, if we get praised, especially if we're socialized female. Yeah. That praise does not usually land. It usually triggers shame. But what is it that is triggered? The triggered feeling itself is the thing that we're trying to catch. Who is it that feels understood or misunderstood? Who is the one that feels good enough or not good enough? That one that got triggered, that somehow set up a target to be hit, that's the object of negation. So it's that very feeling of triggeredness, whatever it is that got the, I don't know, got the arrow stuck to it. That's the one to investigate. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that one in. Um, Judy, go ahead. Yeah. Hello. Um, just two, two different things. My concentration is pretty bad this afternoon. I don't know why. But anyway, the term basis, I use the term the basis, like the basis from which we work. I, I think it means, a, I, th I, think, I think I've also heard the term basis used in terms of us. Uh, we have the materials, the resources to do this work because we have a precious human rebirth. That's it's, not basis. Is that more ground? No, what we're talking about is, is in a way simpler than that. It's the basis upon which you put a label. Ah. Yeah, the basis of imputation is just the collection of things that you label on. So, oh, for, okay. right, so for example, the basis of imputation of the letter A are the three lines that we label A on when we see those three lines. Okay, okay, my mind was somewhere else, obviously. And also, I just wanted to just make a comment. The term Atma, mm -hmm. um, which comes from the sort of ancient yogic traditions, soul, which is also in Christianity, obviously. I don't, I think it can, I think it, there's no, there's no schism within that and Buddhism. So I think it's, that's the Buddha nature. But my understanding of the term Atma from being involved in the yoga tradition for a long time, Atma is that which is eternal within. Just perfect. Yeah, and, and that's what we negate. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, don't, don't, I, I mean, in terms of, in, I don't know, that, good in nature, then whatever that is. Look, that, that's it's getting into a philosophical debate territory, which we can totally agree to disagree. Um, I 100% respect the Vedic tradition and the Christian tradition, and I think their ethics can lead to a healthy, wholesome, profound human being with all sorts of meditative abilities. 100%. What is unique about Buddhism is the view. You don't have to believe the view, but the view is that there is no permanent self whatsoever. There is a continuity of consciousness that changes moment to moment. So it's a continuation, but it's more like a river changing in every moment rather than a little core thread pulling yeah, but The Buddha nature itself. That's, not, that's nothing to do with the self of consciousness deeper. Well, it's a characteristic of consciousness, right? Buddha nature is a characteristic of, of consciousness and it's the characteristic of it lacking inherent existence. That's why it can transform. So it's Buddha potential rather than Buddha actualization. You're not a Buddha yet, but you will always have the potential until it has been actualized, right? So the lack of inherently existent mind is your Buddha nature. And I know it's a lot to digest, you know, and it's kind of just rather than feeling like you have to remember everything, remember what struck you. Yeah. Remember what struck you and come back to that and deepen that. And, you know, of all of this sea of words, different things will strike different people. So just kind of hear what lands because it's like, that's where your, your wisdom said, yes, I almost knew that, or I already knew that, but I forgot. And, you know, go back and back and back to that, but yeah, absolutely, I'll give you my notes. Yeah, other, other emptiness questions or thoughts before we do a little experimental gentle version of one? It's, it's an important conversation on, on many levels. I mean, I, I'm aware that there's not a lot of young people in the class, but you know, if we had um, 
more Gen Z kids here, we would be aware of how much they talk about identity and how big a deal it is for them discussing identity relation, you know, discussing gender identity, sexual identity, racial identity, economic identity. Identity is a big deal for the kids, right? And what they are saying is an important conversation that absolutely deserves airtime and compassion. But what we're talking about in Buddhism is know how you identify and then see that it lacks inherent existence. Know how you see yourself, know how the world may project onto you and realize none of that is you. But you still live within that space and are influenced by having been built that way or having built yourself that way. So it's, it's kind of a delicate thing of the way we are in the world is how do we help people have equanimity? Yeah, how do we help people have equanimity and break down prejudices and just be nice to each other for goodness sakes, just be kind. While at the same time, knowing that what creates ideas of us and them in any context is based in ignorance. So if you're saying I am too strongly, you're immediately setting up there is other. We already have that, but we sometimes make it worse with our politics, <laughs> yeah? So it's like, I can say, I am a woman merely labeled by the mind. I am a, a woman merely labeled on my collection of parts, but in another context, in another time, I might've been labeled differently and whatever, who cares? But for other people, it might be a bigger deal to them. So I need to be sensitive to the fact that just because I'm like, yeah, whatever, <laughs> other people are not. Okay, so we all have to be careful with that because the way trauma has happened to us is very different. And the way people have been unkind to us is very different. And it's often the way people identify us that we've been the recipient of a lot of pain. You know, whether it's because of our gender or our race or our sexuality or whatever, or our perceived gender, race, sexuality or whatever, right? Like in some places like in Russia, People are very unkind to me because I'm a non-conforming lady person because I got no hair, <laughs> no hair. Yeah. And they think, <gasps> you know, but in America, they're like, oh, yeah, no hair, whatever. They don't care. Yeah. Or they think, oh, do you have cancer? They're really nice about it. But, you know, it's all contextual. When I'm in India, I get in trouble for going to the ladies room because they think I'm a man because I'm tall. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, the way people project their stuff can either bounce off of us or we take it on and hurts and can reinforce the very identities we're trying to deconstruct. So when I'm having this conversation with you guys, I know that you're hearing it from subtler ears because you're Dharma students, but remember that your non-Dharma friends or your new Dharma friends might have have a lot of very strong, painful ways of identifying that are related to very real trauma. And we need to be really conscious and kind to people about that. So it's kind of like you have your inner conversation and then your outer conversation is a lot more holistic and aware of what the world is talking about these days. Does that make sense? Do you guys know what I'm on about? Yeah, okay, <laughs> keep it friendly. Okay, we'll do a little meditation. So get yourself nice posture, straight back. A few breaths to ground yourself. Checking in if you've developed any tension in the body. And if so, just gently encouraging it to release if it's ready. But in any case, just being present in the body. Scanning up and down the spine, allowing it to come into its best alignment. Scanning side to side, allowing the body to come into its best balance.
and revive your motivation. Refuge in bodhicitta to yourself, letting it reconnect and deepen. and shift to analysis and start with the idea of recognizing the object to be negated, which is the self that seems inherent. So first, just try to find that. Times when you might've been upset or really worked up. Times when your life might've been in danger or even when someone praised you or criticized you, just when that sense of I roared up to the surface. First, just find that sense. Maybe in our mind we say, but that's me, I'm a special case. Or, but that's me, how dare you? Oh, but it's me, now you don't like me. So whether it's arrogance or insecurity or fear or grief or whatever it is, don't get lost in the story, but use a story to provoke it into prominence to see that self that seems to be permanent, self-made, continuously there. It almost seems like the self you are now is the same as the self you were when you were five years old, but you've just built more learning and experience onto it, but somehow it's the same little core. Feels that way even though it's not that way. And so as you think about this seeming inherently existent self, Ask some questions about it. Ask, is this self completely divorced from arising in dependence upon causes and conditions? Is there anything causeless, spontaneous in this self? Any aspect of my personality, any part of my body, any way of thinking that is without cause. If the self was inherent, it would have to be one with or the same as all its parts, which would mean that there was a self with every single part. There would be multiple selves, a hand self and a mind self and an intention self. That would be madness. So then you think, oh, well, then the self must be different to the parts. This inherently existent self must be something separate or additional to all those moving parts. And so where is it if it's separate and different, the boss of all the parts of you? The 
it might feel like it's your mind's intention or your mind's movement. But that's influenced by the mind's feelings and the way it describes things and what it's come into contact with. Sometimes the self, the inherent self seems like feeling itself, the mood that you're in, the trends of your mind. But if you nudge at it a little bit, you see all that of those are influenced by many causes and conditions. Not a core you making it, it's a dependent arising. And so see if the idea that the self can't be inherent because it's not one with the parts or separate from the parts. It can only be that which is labeled on the collection, but not more than that. And if that's true of me, it's true of others and phenomena. Why would that be different? For the self, others, and all phenomena to be, there must be supports. Those supports are the causes and conditions, or the parts, or the context, and just the mind itself that labels there. Is there anything you can think of, yourself, others, phenomena, the physical world, anything that is not dependently arisen? Is there anything that made itself and perpetuates itself anywhere? And see how it feels to rest in the idea that absolutely everything dependently arises, which means it cannot be empty of it. It cannot be inherently existent. It can't be inherently existent because it depends. It is empty of inherence. which doesn't imply anything in its stead. Emptiness is a non-affirming negation, but it's not the same as nothingness, not the same as nihilism. Tiptoe to the edge and pull back. and land on the conclusion, as Lama Tsongkhapa would say, that all phenomena are empty of inherent existence because they dependently arise. And through this merit, may we quickly cut the root of samsara 
by realizing emptiness directly. And from there, may we go on to achieve full enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. And you can relax your attention. Okay. So lots of different ways to do an emptiness meditation. Sometimes it can work as just a reflection in your daily life as soon as you've been triggered. And you can think of the three spheres of emptiness, agent, action, object, yeah? The agent, the catalyst, the thing that did the thing is empty of inherent existence because it dependently arises. You can think of different causes and conditions that motivated that agent of change, right? Yeah, agent. The action itself, completely empty of an inherent existence because it dependently arises. How did the action happen? The critical word, the unkind speech of whatever type, how did it happen, that action? Dependently. If you hadn't been there, if they hadn't been there, if it had been a little cooler, if it had been a little hotter, if everyone's blood sugar was happening well, if you hadn't created the cause karmically, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, action, empty. Yeah, agent, action, and the object that whatever what was done was done to, completely empty of inherent existence because it dependently arises. Yeah, think of how the object came into being, how it came to be the object, right place, right time, wrong place, right, wrong time, all of that. Agent, action, object, empty. If you can even just think that in the middle of an argument, you might release needing to win, or at least your agitation will settle. Yeah, or if you feel particularly tight about something, it can release it. It also can help you when you're happy, but too happy. Yes, when you're going into like excited spinning, that kind of um, kind of sugar happiness where you start being negligent to other people, which doesn't happen to us as much as we get older, but it can still happen. It's more kind of like a teenage frenzy kind of at a rock concert sort of a vibe where you're knocking people over and don't even realize it because you're just dancing. That kind of like way upregulated excitement that you think, oh, which is empty of inherent existence. Or you can think, oh, it's impermanent. That works too. Yeah. So, you know, whenever you're feeling a powerful negative emotion in its moment, usually sutra analysis is not the best idea in the moment of the negative state of mind. Before it happens to prevent it, analyze. After you've settled down, analyze. But with emptiness, emptiness doesn't usually make it worse in the moment. It's an interesting thing to experiment with, right? So the next time you're angry, you know the antidote to anger is love or patience, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But love and patience in the middle of your anger often doesn't work. Your anger takes it and starts analyzing about all the reasons why they don't deserve it. <laughs> yeah. But after you settle down, you can come back to your love or come back to your patience. But in the middle of anger, if you remember emptiness, it kind of pops the balloon of the anger and it goes, all right, yeah, <laughs> yep, never mind. It's an interesting experiment. So the other kind of antidotes before, they, before the affliction happens, after you've settled down from the affliction, do good deep analysis, but in the middle, maybe wait and do mindfulness or experiment with what happens if you think about emptiness right in the middle of it, in the thick of it. Yeah. So questions, thoughts, arguments, insights. How do you feel about the Wheel of Sharp Weapons? There, I mean, there's some, it, it's a long text, right? There's a few hundred, there's a hundred and something verses. And some of them, you read them and you just laugh at yourself. You know, you think, oh my gosh, the human condition. We're such nutcases. It's, it's a tale as old as time, but it should be read with that idea of, okay, I'm not alone. <laughs> yeah, I'm not alone. This is the way people have been. Don't overthink it, just work on it. Yeah. Verse 28, when our mind becomes clouded whenever we study, this is the wield of sharp weapons returning full circle upon us from wrongs we have done. Till now, we have thought the study of Dharma lacked prime importance and could be ignored. Hereafter, let's build up the habits of wisdom to listen and think about what Buddha taught. All right, it's so practical. 
And it's so helpful because you think, yeah, sometimes I get a bit foggy when I'm studying. How come? What's this obstacle about? Well, it's from having put it aside and ignored it in the past. I just need to change the trend. Yeah, or when sleep overwhelms us when practicing virtue, this is the wheel of sharp weapons returning full circle upon us from wrongs we have done. Till now we have gathered the causes for obstacles hindering our practice of virtuous acts. We have lacked all respect for spiritual teachings, sat on our books, left text on the ground, looked down on those who with deep insight, right? Hereafter, for the sake of our practice of Dharma, let's gladly endure all hardships we meet. You know, so it goes on and each of them are really worth asking, am I still doing this? Yeah, am I still doing this? Or am I actually finishing a pattern I've stopped doing and it's at its end soon? You know, but a lot of these you see, oh, I don't like the result. And oh, no, I'm still creating the cause. Yeah, you read them and you go, wow, I don't like this result. I experience this result all the time. And oh, no, I'm creating the cause still. Have an oh, no, but like kind of a humorous oh, no, of I better cut that out. You know, don't make it heavy. Yeah. Make it like, oh, better to know. Do you know what I mean? I very solemnly wrote down the words yesterday, thought projects. I have no idea what that was. Could you remind me, please? <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was the idea that you don't have to make all of these into a meditation right away. You can have thought projects, meaning things that you have organized to think about when you're doing other things like chores or walking the dog, right? You think, okay, today's walk, I'm going to really look at how self-cherishing plays out in my relationship with my mother-in-law. <laughs> you know, it's your thought project. Yeah, so it, it's, it's good to be organized with your Dharma study in that way where it feels like something fun and enriching that you can weave into your life and not feel like it's only worthwhile if you're sitting properly and knowing what you're doing. You know, that okay. reflection stage is really important. Thank you. Yeah, I, you're I, welcome. I knew it was important, otherwise I wouldn't have written it down. Right. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. And no thank worries. you for the whole weekend. You're, I love your teachings. Really oh, thanks, Brenda. It. They're really helpful to me. Thank you. Why is this text particularly associated with Yamantaka? I'm I, missing something here. <laughs> well, Yamantaka being the slayer of the Lord of Death and Yama being the Lord of Death, the, the whole idea is how do you transform the mind into bodhicitta? Normally, we're talking about kind of warm-hearted, sweet, fuzzy, inspiring ways. The thrust of this text is... How do you develop aggression towards the right thing? Yeah. So it's, it's a more hardcore way of mind training that, you know, it's, it's delicate. But if you think of the essence of Yamantaka is Manjushri wisdom, which cuts through ignorance. But the way in which Yamantaka is different to Manjushri is that his aspect is incredibly wrathful. And he's incredibly wrathful because you need powerful energy to intimidate negative states of mind. Because our negative states of mind will find a way to justify themselves and kind of like tag along with our best of intentions. You know, so we'll like think, I'm going to offer food to the poor. And then our self-cherishing will say, and aren't you a good person for doing so? Pat, 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 right? You need Yamataka to go roar, <laughs> It's a dependent arising. You are not special for offering food to the poor. It's a dependent arising. It's wonderful, but don't get cocky, <laughs> right? Like, it's it's just a different way of approaching mind training. And of course, Dharma Rikshita had a strong connection with Yamantaka, so that works for him. But it's just a different style of mind training, a little bit more fierce. And I think that for us, it can kind of shock us a little bit in a helpful way as long as we're in a not too fragile headspace when we're reading it. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So if, if it helps, just remember Yamantaka Manjushri, same, same. Sword of wisdom cutting through ignorance. I just would like to um, 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 make a comment and ask a little bit about Tonglen um, practice. I have noticed in my life that um, there are often something that um, makes me feel uncomfortable or shocks me a little bit. And I automatically think uh, th th 
that, that hasn't happened to me or it can ha- can't happen to me or mm. it doesn't concern me um, actually happens to me later mm. or somehow, um, you know, it's a bit like I am, uh, I notice things that are probably, you know, important from mm, the karmic perspective or somehow my mind is attracted. But if mm. it is suffering, I am afraid of it yeah, and I don't want it. And I try to say, oh, no, 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 this is not about me. This is about someone else, but this is not about me. And um, today I realized that um, I did the Tonga Lai meditation for the first time. I have read about it many times, but I was afraid to do it by myself. Mm. So I really appreciated the opportunity to do it together. And I think um, I realized that that, that practice may help me to um, notice things in my life with the right attitude. So if I notice some, some suffering, I can take it yeah. and offer <laughs> um, in, 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 in a, I don't know what to say, like an effective way or healthy yeah. way and offer my happiness instead of, um, pushing it away or thinking that it does not concern me or it's not about me or my life yeah so um is this the right attitude is this the right situation to use the tonglen practice it or can be. yeah it can be it's it's one of a lot of ways that work really well i think there's there's really important insight you've got in there which is sometimes when we see suffering of others that we don't relate to part of us, it doesn't want to relate to it because we really hope it, hope it won't happen to us. Yeah. Like, I don't know, something really basic, like someone steals your wallet. I don't know. And you've never had your wallet stolen and someone tells you about their wallet being stolen and you think, what were they doing? Oh, they must have had it out on the table so it was easy to get at. Oh, they must have had a really uh, bad pocket situation. So it was, the, uh, it was something that I would never do. So I would never have my wallet stolen because I don't ever leave my wallet. Oh, and you go into a whole thing about how that couldn't happen to you because you're not so foolish as this person. When really it's showing you how vulnerable we all are. And if you do Tonglen in that moment, then you can be fully present with your friend who had the scary thing happen. And you're not bringing all of your fear about it happening to you to the table. You can just hold the space for them without that little inner dance of, here's all the reasons why that wouldn't happen to me because I'm freaked out. I don't want that to happen to me, (laughs) you know? Mm -hmm. So definitely you can do Tonglen in that context. It's a great idea. Yeah. Just a quick comment that I really appreciate that you pointed us in the direction of Alex Burson's poetic translation. I mean, even right from the beginning of it, you know, that he's not talking about devils. Yeah. He finds other, he finds other ways. It, but it, it was really wonderful. So it, it made okay. it so much more. It's a hard text, but it made it so much more accessible. So thank good. you. Oh, good. I'm glad you like that version. Yeah, I like it too. And I, I, I wrote to him. He's so accessible. You can just write Alex Burson, you know. I wrote it him and I said, is it okay if we use this version? And he said, yeah, sure. No worries. So anyway, that Study Buddhism website is just an amazing resource. And Dr. Burson is such a champion. So sometimes his translations are bewildering and sometimes they're amazing and it's a little hit and miss, but it's a stylistic thing. So I, we love his work and we thank him kindly. Um, this one, this verse that I'm going to read, it's, I think it, it renders well in most of the translations, but the way that he's um, found a way to pace it is just lovely. So this is one of the last emptiness verses and um, I think you guys will like it. So verse 112 says, when musicians are playing a beautiful melody, we should examine the sound they are making we would see that it does not exist by itself. But when we're not making our formal analysis, still there's a beautiful tune to be heard, which is merely a label on notes and on players. That's why lovely music can lighten sad hearts. So this is the beautiful play of emptiness and dependent arising together and looking at the way, despite it being empty, still there is beauty but not in and of itself. And so it's kind of the way of holding all of these things together. And so we dedicate, thus accepting ourselves all diluted non-virtuous actions that others have done in the past, in the present, in the future, 
with mind, speech, and body. May delusions of others, as well as our own, be the favored conditions to gain our enlightenment, just as the peacocks eat poisons and thrive. As crows may be cured after swallowing poison by a powerful antidote given in time, let's direct to all others our virtuous merit, that this may replenish their chances for freedom. May all sentient beings reach Buddhahood soon. Jantu semcho rinpoche, ma ke panam ke gyochi, ke panyam pa me pa hi, gone gondu pawasho, toni dawa rinpoche, ma ke panam ke gyochi, ke panyam pa me pa hi, gone gondu pawasho. The wish granting, wish fulfilling jewel, source of every single benefit and happiness in this world the incomparably kind Supreme Tenzin Gatso. May you have a long life and all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. Okay, so thank you very thank much. You very much. And um, thank, thank you, you for Joy. Thank you. On behalf of uh, Line of Joy, so may I offer you a virtual card. We really want to thank you very much for your outstanding teaching. And also we thank you on behalf of Land of Joy, we thank you everyone to join this amazing teaching. Without you, we will not have this kind of teaching, right? <laughs> so thank you very much for your participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you Agnes, as well. Yeah, thank, really you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you soon. See you. Thank you.